Hi everybody, hope you're well. Today I will read from a book titled Machine Amusée, The Life and Death of the Best Guy Penthouse Apartment by Wien Vandenberg, published by MIT Press. The book in front of you is the result of my long-standing fascination with a particular sort of building, the so-called autobiographical house. In this type of dwelling, two distinct forces confront one another, the idea of the house and the idea of the home. The house is the spatial manifestation of the architect's conception of living, an architectural shell that incorporates their general ideas about the domestic form. The home, on the other hand, is how the owner or resident expresses their personal way of living within and around this architectural frame. Under normal circumstances, these two concepts do not simultaneously act upon the design, rather, one follows the other. The architect designs and constructs the house, after which the resident transforms the dwelling into their personal home. This sequential development does not apply to the autobiographical house, where the inhabitant is, to varying degrees, also the designer. In a number of celebrated examples, any tension implicit in this expansion of responsibilities is diffused by virtue of the fact that the owner and the architect are one and the same. Konstantin Melnikov's own house, Louis Barragan's Casa Barragan, Philip Johnson's Glass House, or Oscar Niemeyer's Das Canoas all continue a long tradition of architects, artists and designers building houses for themselves. In such cases, the autobiographical house is not simply a dwelling to inhabit, but a container for ideas, a place, quite literally, to house something both physical and ideological. However, some of the more profound autobiographical houses in the modern canon occupy a nebulous spatial realm. These are dwellings that have been built for others. They involve a second party, the client, who abdicates to the architect the responsibility for imagining a house in their own image. And crucially, what the architect is designing is not a permanent residence, but a weekend or holiday house. Noteworthy examples might include the Farnsworth House in Plano, Illinois, by Miss Van der Rohe, Falling Water in Mill Run, Pennsylvania, by Frank Lloyd Wright, or perhaps most famous of all, the Villa Savoie in Poissy by Le Corbusier and his cousin Pierre Janaret. Another subgroup of autobiographical houses were neither designed nor inhabited by their architect creators, nor conceived as an architectural manifesto courtesy of an obliging client. Based less on a sort of monologue interior of the designer-architect and more on a dialogue between architect and inhabitant, these houses are particularly revealing in the ways they challenge our usual conceptions of authorship. In some cases, there is a mutual understanding between parties that allows the conversation to develop more or less without conflict. For example, the Schroeder House in Utrecht, the best known example of the steel architecture, represents the shared ideas of both the architect, Gerrit Rietveld, and the client, Truss Schroeder Schroeder, who worked side by side right up to the house's completion in 1924. The following decade, Alvar Alto would design the Villa Mairea for Henry and Marie Galixen, a couple sustained by a lifelong faith in techno-utopianism. So fruitful was the partnership that the Galixens built a business, Artec, largely around the manufacture and distribution of their architects' signature furniture and glassware. In less harmonious instances, the visions of client and architect are diametrically opposed. One example is the writer Curzio Malaparte, who famously rejected the project of his architect Adalberto Libera and instead undertook to design and build his villa on Capri himself with the help of a local stonemason. 
And while the architect of the Villa Noailles in Hier in the south of France is, on paper, Robert Malestivan, in practice it was the client, Charles de Noailles, who directed every aspect of its conception and composition. Such authority was no doubt seeded by the fact that Noailles and his wife, Marie Loire, were not only members of the French aristocracy, but leading patrons of avant-garde artists and modern architecture. The couple, along with their fabled living quarters in the countryside and in Paris, offered a cove table blueprint for aspiring members of Parisian high society to emulate, and their Villa Noailles, in particular, provided a certain amount of inspiration for the subject of this book. In 1929, one year after the completion of the Villa Noailles, the millionaire bachelor Charles de Bestilly rented the top floor of a building on one of the most prestigious streets in Paris, the Champs-Élysées. Noailles just so happened to own the building next door. Born in France, Dauphine of a Mexican diplomat posted to Madrid and Lisbon, Bestegui was educated in Eton among the English aristocracy before joining his parents in Paris at the outbreak of World War I. His family line and vast fortune afforded him entry to the upper echelons of society, and he counted kings Edward VII of England and Alfonso XIII of Spain as close personal friends. For the gilded elite of the 1920s, life offered a seemingly endless succession of salons, balls, soirees, exhibitions, performances and screenings. Having grown up in this world, having lived and breathed its decadence, Bestegui was no stranger to its rhythms. By the late 1920s, however, he was no longer content to merely attend the balls and parties organized by his friends, but resolved to host his own. And so, in the summer of 1929, in the midst of a heady social season, Bestegui commissioned Le Corbusier and Pierre Janaret to design a penthouse apartment. Une maison et une machine à habiter. Le Corbusier had famously declared in his manifesto Verso Architecture just a few years before. The Bestegui penthouse was a different kind of machine altogether. Rather than being designed for everyday life, it was dedicated solely to entertainment, a machine à amuser. But it was not just a fascination for autobiographical houses that prompted me to delve into the genesis of the Bestegui penthouse. My research was also motivated by a certain frustration with the overly spectacular nature of much architectural writing on the work. By the time of architecture's historical turn in the 1970s, the penthouse of Charles de Bestegui was no more. A defunct masterpiece of modern architecture, it lived on only on a surprisingly small clutch of photographs first published between 1932 and 1938, and in a single plan, which was not even of the interior, but of the roof terrace. For many writers, such absences did not seem to matter. The dearth of tangible material left space for subjective interpretations, much of which focused on either the project's supposed surrealist associations or the electromechanical ingenuity of its remote-controlled movable walls and rooftop planters, both of which were almost always attributed solely to Le Corbusier, despite the lack of supporting evidence. Such interpretations entirely overlooked the role of the client. From the very beginning, I suspected that Charles de Bestegui had heavily influenced, if not actually dictated, these elements, to say nothing of the stylistic eclecticisms many observers read as surrealism. But in order to dispel many of the myths that had gathered around the penthouse, I needed to investigate not only the apartment, but also its client, and the moment and milieu in which it was conceived. Accordingly, the first part of this architectural detective story begins with Bestegui, focusing in particular on the succession of parties he felt compelled to attend. 
this prehistory of the Bestegui apartment can be pieced together not from a conventional architectural archive, but from the pages of assorted society and fashion magazines, including Harper's Bazaar, Decoration de France, Plaisir de France, Domus, and especially American and French Vogue. Following this trail leads to Bestegui's firm resolution to create a party space of his own, if not who might actually design such a space. The second part of the story answers this key question, showing that the commission to design the penthouse was initially a competition among three architects, André Lourcard, Gabriel Gouvrequian and the ultimately successful pairing of Le Corbusier and Pierre Chanaret. The third part looks in detail at the evolution of the design and the way the building was shaped by an often intense series of discussions between client and architect, many of which took part after the ostensible conclusion of the design phase. It tracks the Bestegui apartment through seven preliminary design stages, more than 340 drawings of the project preserved in the Fondation Le Corbusier, as well as detailed correspondence between architects and clients. But Bestegui wouldn't have been Bestegui if he hadn't changed things after the architects had already started producing construction drawings. What was eventually built has not been documented in any archive, and certainly not in the form of plans, sections and elevations. To fill the lacuna, a set of detailed reconstruction drawings forms an appendix to the third part. The drawings are based on the working plans and correspondence held at the Fondation Le Corbusier, but crucially they are amended and refined in light of the visual information extracted from numerous old photographs of the completed penthouse. In the fourth and last part of the book, the investigation looks at the afterlife of the Bestegui penthouse apartment, through a detailed analysis of its reception in the years from 1932 to 1938, following by a coda that unpicks its piecemeal disassembly and abandonment in the years up to 1961. In particular, it tracks the stark contrast between how the building was described in the second volume of its nominal architect's oeuvre complet, a brusque 125-word text and handful of photographs, and how it was described in often gushing, but also highly informative prose, in the fashion and society magazines of the time. Such a contrast also highlights a division of responsibilities. For what the oeuvre complet was documented in an emotive, rather technical language, was the shell of a rooftop apartment, whereas what the society magazines were celebrating was an interior and a vast array of carefully selected surfaces, textures and objects that defined it. Of course, implicit in such a separation are the differing accounts of authorship, for ultimately what the case of this penthouse apartment reveals is that the machine of this house was the product of the architects Le Corbusier and Jeanneret, but the amusement and, with it, the very identity, even meaning of its architecture, was wholly attributable to its owner and occupant, Charles de Bestegui. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.